Welcome everyone. Um, I am uh, Dr. Scott Bowen. I am the chair of the psychology department here at Wayne State University. And I have the honor of basically starting this um, inaugural uh, lecture series. Uh, before I get into the specifics about the Prochaskos and the, and the lecture series, I wanna take just a second to mention a few housekeeping items. Um, first, uh, please feel free to post questions in the chat for the question and answer session with Dr. Sue which will occur at the end of the program. Um, second, for students that are needing course credit and those seeking psychology or social work continuing education CEs, um, this is if the an attendance sign-up link will be posted in the chat at the beginning of the lecture for students that are seeking extra credit and professionals looking for CEs. Uh, please be sure to sign in here. Uh, for those seeking psychology CEs, there will also be a link posted uh, to the chat at the end of the event for an evaluation quiz, which will, you will then receive for your CEs. And finally, for those seeking social work uh, continuing education credits, uh, please check your email in the next few days for an evaluation quiz link. Um, once completed, you will receive your uh, continuing education certificate uh, via email. And with that, um, like I said, I have the honor of uh, introducing and, and giving it just a brief overview of the Prochaska uh, lecture series. And today marks the first ever speaker in the James and Janice Prochaska annual lecture series. This lecture series is important because it highlights the intersection between the fields of psychology and social work and provides our faculty with the opportunity to collaborate on topics of shared interest and concern. The Prochaska um, Lecture Series was established by two uh, very notable Wayne State alumni, Dr. James Prochaska, who earned his Bachelor of Arts and PhD in Psychology right here at Wayne State University in our program, and his wife, Dr. Janice uh, Prochaska, who earned her Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and her Master's in Social Work for, um, here from Wayne State University. Janice then subsequently earned her PhD in social work administration and policy from Boston College. Together, uh, James and Janice founded the ProChange Behavioral Systems Incorporated Company. Um, this company was dedicated to helping individuals improve their lives by making healthier choices. So on behalf of the School of Social Work and the Department of Psychology, I wanna express our gratitude to the Prochaskas for making this lecture possible today. So thank you very much. Um, I also have some good news to share. Uh, James and Janice are so committed to the Prochaska le lecture that they have made, uh, made arrangements to endow the lecture in their estate plans. So we thank you for their generosity, uh, which will ensure that relevant and thought-provoking discussions, much like the one that we will have today, will take place each year in perpetuity. So thank you, James and Janice, for your support of Wayne State and your commitment to advancing knowledge. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dean Cheryl Kubiak, uh, the Dean of School of School Social Work. Thanks, Scott. I am very happy to introduce Dr. Kimberly Sue. She's a medical doctor with a PhD in anthropology. She's the medical director of the National Harm Reduction Coalition, where she provides national training and technical assistance to improve the health and well being of people who use drugs. Dr. Sue is a practicing board certified addiction medicine internist and an assistant professor in addiction medicine at Yale, Uni Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Sue is a graduate of the Harvard Medical School Social Science MD PhD program and completed her medical training at Massachusetts General. Her 2019 book, Getting Wrecked, Women, Incarceration, and the American Opioid Crisis, uses a medical anthropologist's lens to examine the intersection of US prison systems, addiction policy, mental health, and drug treatment with women in Massachusetts. She's worked in diverse clinical environments, including syringe service programs, methadone clinics, and the Rikers Island jail system in New York City. You can, and I will, follow her on Twitter at Dr. Kim Sue. Dr. Sue, given the common research interest with many of us at Wayne State, I am thrilled to hear your talk today and welcome you to Wayne State University. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and thank you to Wayne State for inviting me. Thank you to the Prochaskas for 
the honor of giving this first lecture and I hope it's a, a fruitful discussion uh, based on so many things you all are doing in Detroit and Michigan, as well as things that we're doing and facing around the country. So I'm gonna share my slides. I hope you can see them. So thank you so much for having me. So my talk today is some of my musings on the, um, on the 50th year of the US war on drugs, mass incarceration and harm reduction. And this talk really will triangulate you and take you through a variety of different both theoretical lenses and ways that we can think about current problems that we're all experiencing and potentially pose some solutions. I have no relevant financial disclosures of conflicts of interest. And, you know, I'll start off with this slide, which is that the US incarceration rate has and is the highest rate in the world. So currently in 2020, we have approximately 2 million people who are currently incarcerated. But the, that number of people who are actually affected by the carceral uh, and the criminal justice system is, is quite higher uh, uh, than that. Uh, we know that on average, 10 million people cycle in and out of jails every year. So there's a lot of people who might not be currently incarcerated, but many people are going through these, these systems. I'll, I'll take us back to some of the way that these are related. So Nixon, uh, actually we're now reflecting this entire year on Richard Nixon having declared the war on drugs in June of 1971. So we're now 50 years later and um, taking you through sort of this chronology and some of the ways in which the, uh, the carceral and, and the criminal approach to thinking about substance use in many ways has been a failure. So again, in 1971, uh, Nixon declared drug abuse public enemy number one. Um, at that time, you can see that the, the level of the number of people in prison and jail expanded dramatically. We had tough on crime uh, uh, sentences across you know, many a variety of states, three strikes you're out, basically dis, uh, disallowing judges from having any discretion, mandatory minimum sentences for drugs. Like in New York state, we had the Rockefeller drug laws. And so many of these actually you know, came into effect and led to the incarceration of, of many Americans, even for things such as possession. So currently, uh, you know, one in five incarcerated people is incarcerated for a drug offense. And this is a distribution of where people are located. And the one thing that I'd like to point out for me as, as an addiction medicine doctor is less than 1% of these facilities offer any medication for opioid use disorder. So while many people are, are you know, incarcerated for uh, crimes related to substance use, we aren't actually offering them evidence-based treatment. Just to go over a little bit of the differences between jail and prison and, and community supervision, because this is important for, for us, us all to know. So often we have jail systems like uh, where I, I've practiced medicine, Rikers Island is a local jail system. Many people who are at, at Rikers Island currently uh, as, as inmates are, are pre-trial and uh, they haven't been, or they've been convicted of a misdemeanor, but many of them have, have been pre-trial. They're often there for less than one year, although that could be longer. And uh, prison is when they get sentenced, it could be federal or state, and they're convicted of a, of, of a crime, a felony, or they've, or they've pled guilty through, through a variety of um, other sentencing means. And community supervision, uh, probation and parole is, is also something that I'm sure you guys interface with a lot um, as well, which is a vast number of people who are on probation or parole who are subject to uh, going back to, to, to jail or prison based on certain, um, certain stipulations uh, of, of being out in the community. So um, I'm going to focus on the people who are incarcerated because of substance use and, and, and our drug laws in the US. And I'm gonna present you reflecting on uh, the, the drug war at 50, the, uh, some statistics that I'd like us to think about as we grapple with you know, a worsening overdose crisis. And we're trying to re-envision new ways to think about addressing substance use in, in this day and age. 
So the number of arrests in 2020 for drug law violations, over a million, the vast majority for personal possession alone. I'd like to also point out that you know, many of those uh, were for uh, marijuana or cannabis. We know that these arrests tend to be disproportionately affect uh, black indigenous people of color. The drug war has a massive financial impact that we as taxpayers participate in. I will read you the numbers, but you can see um, how, how, how massive uh, uh, of, a, of a financial toll that, that we, how, how much money we pour into, into these systems. Um, I, would, I would point out that 3.5 billion is the amount we spend to fund the Drug Enforcement Admin, uh, Agency uh, in 2021. And uh, a lot of these go towards um, systems of surveillance and social control that I'll talk about. Uh, that, that in many ways, uh, my argument is that um, ha have not worked uh, that, that well for us for, from a health standpoint. This uh, drug war also has become a, a tool of mass community surveillance with more people being surveilled in their communities and incarcerated. So we did mention on the previous slide how probation and parole were vehicles of, of community supervision. Um, and these... Um, these unfortunately are, have really constrained a, a lot of people in their ability to live. You know, I've seen many people uh, in Rikers Island, for example, who were violated uh, for not for you know not being um, not being where they said they were sleeping that morning. So that morning, pro, uh, probation and you know and parole had gone out to find them, and, and they were they were at their mother's house. You know, I've seen many people who. Who were using uh, cannabis on a on a on a urine and tested positive on a urine toxicology, even though um, it's now legal in, in New York State. So these are statistics from the Drug Policy Alliance, and um, and you can uh, check out their uh, more of the information on their website. I'd like to also point out that the rise in incarceration and in this uh, this I talk about in my book really also has led to what some people have even called the feminization of the war on drugs. So the, the ways in which women have been disproportionately incarcerated at, at higher rates than, than they've ever been than men, while, while men still remain the, the majority of people currently incarcerated, the rates of incarceration in women have skyrocketed. Uh, this points out sort of the disparity in, in state sentencing, and, and, I'll, and I'll point out that women's state prisons populations grew 834%. This really does vary significantly by state. And in many cases, we there's a lot of reasons why this is, and I'd love, I'd love to talk to you about this more separately. Um, in many cases, women lack access to some many of the resources that men access. Um, uh, on, during incarceration or after incarceration, there are not approaches that take into a, a, account their families, their children. We know that ma the majority of women who are incarcerated are mothers. Um, and so really, uh, many of the efforts at even decarcerating our populations in the states have, have dis disproportionately left out women. For example, going to boot camp. So in, in New York State, where, where I practiced medicine for a couple of years, um, men could have the option to go to Willard, which is a boot camp style uh, community program. And uh, people who are on mental health medications with an increased proportion of those being women aren't allowed at Willard at the boot camp. So women have to basically stay for their entirety of their sentence. They're not offered a community alternative. So I'll shift in, and say that there are so many harms in, associated with incarceration, and these are harms both during incarceration and after incarceration. And you know, taking care of of, of people and my patients at Rikers Island, you know, I would see uh, many kinds of harms: violence, uh, physical, emotional, psychic trauma, witnessing harms, uh, assaults. Um, physical withdrawal from, from, from substances, disruptions in their medic medical care, uh, suspension of insurance, loss of housing or employment, and self-harm. There are so many collateral consequences when people are released that include many of these things and, and can have a ripple effect on people's ability to get housing or to get employment after they have the, so, so to speak, scarlet letter of, of, of being incarcerated. And uh, from the addiction standpoint, the harms of incarceration uh, 
uh, are, are really high because of the risk of overdose and the increased risk of overdose and death. So this is a seminal paper from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007 that, that demonstrated that uh, post-release mortality of, of people leaving prison and jail uh, was a 12 times higher than the general population in the two weeks after release. And that's from many causes, including heart attack, violence, um, homicide, overdose, but 129% uh, percent, uh, increased risk uh, after, uh, of, of, over, of fatal overdose after in those two weeks. So it's a, it's a very um, high risk period. The dislocation that people experience, the stress they have, it really uh, leads to a lot, of, a lot of consequences generally for poor health. I'd also point out that um, incarceration in many places poses um, a period of, of abstinence, you know, whether, you know, uh, even though people in many cases can access drugs or substances in, in jail and prison settings, but for many people it is a period where they lose tolerance to the drugs that they used to do and they leave and they go out and the, the, the drugs change and they overdose and die. So I, I've had many many people come out of um, upstate prison in New York and, you know, in the period that they were incarcerated for two or five years, uh, the, the drug supply has completely changed. Heroin's no longer heroin, heroin's fentanyl. And as we all know, um, fentanyl is extremely potent and, and that using even a tiny bit of that in some circumstances uh, after prolonged periods of abstinence could, could lead to fatal overdose. So, um, these uh, we're we're shifting now. We're pivoting to talk about uh, overdose deaths, and you might have seen the numbers uh, of overdose deaths that just got released today by the CDC or yesterday in the news, which were uh, now estimated at over a hundred thousand deaths uh, from April two thousand twenty to April two thousand twenty one. So, this is the highest number we've ever had um, uh, in the last you know, 10 years, and we've had the worst year uh, uh, of deaths uh, that we've ever had. This, this increases about 28% from the year before, devastation from COVID and many other reasons, a more toxic uh, street supply of, of substances that's, that's become predominantly fentanyl. And, and so we really have to think about what are we doing? Like, how how can we do something differently? And you know, being on the ground uh, at, at Yale in the Addiction Medicine Consult Service and taking care of people surviving overdoses and taking care of people who are um, are using substances uh, right now is it's a really traumatic and, and terrible time for for everyone. And the stress of COVID has really escalated people's anxiety. It's escalated people's use across the board, alcohol, um, opioids, cocaine, stimulants. So um, I'm gonna put this information up from the CDC, um, uh, overdose surveillance and epidemiology, uh, drug monitoring, overdose to action, uh, data to action uh, uh, grant. And basically this does highlight um, many of the states, uh, how, how they're doing in terms of where overdoses have increased and uh, you know, I would point out that we we are in um, uh, in states, Michigan, and many of many of the states nearby, uh, Connecticut, where where I am, and New York, where where I used to see patients, we're all seeing significant increases, and this is very uh, very very disturbing. And you know, I think it's going to have a ripple effect uh, in terms of additional trauma. So it's really important to note that racial and ethnic disparities in overdose deaths are, are, are taking place and that the um, overdose deaths have have shifted. They've shifted to become uh, primarily uh, disproportionately uh, black Americans have disproportionately high rates of overdose deaths and they are not gaining any um, any momentum in terms of decreases. Uh, so this is this is something that we ne necessarily have to keep our eye on, and we have to and we have to figure out um, what we're doing for our Black Indigenous uh, people of color. Importantly, um, this this is not just about opioids. Okay, so um, 
most deaths, uh, overdose deaths that we have are polysubstance use, which, remain, which means multiple substances. So we have been seeing for five or the last five or 10 years, stimulant deaths on the rise, and this includes methamphetamine and cocaine, independent of opioids. So we are seeing a lot of deaths that have been rising uh, from, from methamphetamine and cocaine. So I particularly care about, um, about people who are using stimulants um, and, and, uh, and trying to figure out ways that we can effectively treat, treat their, um, their conditions and help them use more safely. Same thing goes with cocaine. So we've been seeing cocaine um, also on the rise as well. And, you know, I'm going to shift now to, uh, be, while having presented the problem, I'd like to present some ways that we can think about the solution. And so at Harm Reduction Coalition, we, we think about harm reduction in two ways. And I toggle between these two, these two definitions because in many cases, as a doctor or as a practitioner, as a social worker on the ground, we can get uh, mired in, in practical um, uh, strategies that help one patient or one client, but I'd like to, to point out that harm reduction more, more broadly is a movement based in a political liberatory framework that shifts power and resources to people vulnerable to structural violence. As a clinician, I'm always on the ground doing harm reduction in my clinic. I'm trying to practice harm reduction, trying to get people what they need, which I would we define as a wide ranging set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use with ideas ranging from abstinence to managed use. And, you know, just to bring in a little anthropology, a little theory for you all, um, these are some concepts that I use that I think can help us frame our solution and frame what is going on. So if you weren't familiar with the term structural violence um, in the previous uh, slide, it really references uh, liberation theologist in the 1960s, Johann Galtung, social structures that prevent individuals and communities from maximizing human potential. And um, structural vulnerability is a framework that many anthropologists and physician anthropologists have, have come up with, which tries to understand an individual's risk based on where they sort of live in this in this system of socioeconomic, political, and cultural hierarchies, and what makes some people more, quote unquote, structurally vulnerable, instead of focusing perhaps myopically on individual risk behaviors, thinking about people's conditions and social conditions that, um, that have led to uh, some of their risk factors for, let's say, increased morbidity and mortality or premature death. And of course, I think it's really important for us to talk about and name institutional and structural racism. And so thinking about the hospitals that we work in, thinking about the clinics and thinking about our, our educational institutions, how we can name, uh, how we can name uh, what might be at play. There was a, there's a wonderful article in the New England Journal of Medicine by Rachel Hardiman in Minnesota who talks about the need to shift from the focus of the race of the patient to racism faced by the patient. There was a terrible um, sort of incident, I, I remember in, during COVID where, where a black doctor um, who ultimately died of COVID asked for pain medication related to having COVID uh, and she uh, was denied it. Um, she was in Indiana, she, it was, you know, she went on Facebook and basically you know, called out that she was experiencing racism. Um, she had a ton of pathology in her neck. She had a, a lot related to COVID that, that was quite painful. And had and as a physician, as a black physician, she really couldn't even, uh, her education, she really couldn't, she really couldn't um, even avoid the, the, the experiences that she experienced of being denied pain medication um, as a result of, of racism. We do know also that um, in terms of accessing medication for opioid use disorder, that black patients do not receive buprenorphine at equal rates as, as compared to non-black patients. So that's um, Pooja Lajasetti out of, out of Michigan uh, did this study. And, and we know that black patients are more frequently offered methadone uh, rather than buprenorphine. So these are some, uh, some schematics that I really enjoy uh, presenting and, and talking about with both my trainees, uh, my medical students, as well as at, at larger talks. Uh, 
I want to focus on ways that we can think about individual behaviors and how they're framed by these micro and macro environmental factors. And I think that as psychologists and social workers, you all also like to toggle between these bigger and, 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 and uh, macro and micro views. So thinking, for example, about skin and soft tissue infections or bacterial infections, which we see are on the rise across the country. And so, okay, hand washing, using a, a sterile syringe, all of those things are really important. But if people don't have access to that or they don't have access to that because of their homeless, you know, or because they can't access, uh, they're, they're criminalized and they won't, and they won't and they're afraid of, of, of encountering police when they go to a needle exchange program or they're afraid of encountering police when they go to a methadone program. Those are, are macro factors that really affect individual level behaviors. This is a, a similar schematic that they came up with in terms of thinking about treatment and thinking about all of these other issues in which um, uh, gender inequity sort of laws about policing pregnancy and substance use, stigma, discrimination that, that are at play when people seek treatment. So I'm offering as an alternative to some of the things that we have tried, which are, you know, policing and over-reliance on the criminal justice system. I'm offering harm reduction as a way that we can think about a public health and health-based and human rights-based approach to people who use drugs. So I um, many times encounter people who go, who think harm reduction is syringes or harm reduction is in the lock zone or access to medication like Narcan. Um, and that is uh, a small bit of what we do. So I would say that housing first programs that don't mandate whether you are using substances or not, um, uh, I, would, I would argue that those are, are, um, are harm reduction services. For example, we know many people use methamphetamine to stay awake because they're, um, they're homeless and they've been ra robbed, assaulted, raped um, because of, uh, of, you know, being homeless and they need necessary vigilance to try to protect those from happening in the future. Um, we know that medication, when you can access it in a, in a low barrier, low threshold way is, is a harm reduction approach. You might have heard of fentanyl test strips or safer, um, safer drug use. So we have ways in which we can you know, check someone's supply to see if fentanyl is present. Uh, we also have supervised consumption services overdose prevention centers. So those are places where people use pre-obtained substances under the supervision of uh, a doctor like me or a nurse um, or, or a peer, someone who uses drugs who's trained to respond to overdose. And there are over a hundred in the world uh, and, um, and the alternative uh, you know, to having them is people using uh, Starbucks or McDonald's bathrooms. And, and that is currently what we have in the US. So we have no sanctioned uh, supervised consumption or overdose prevention centers in the US, but um, we hope they're on the horizon. Even having access to a pharmacy who can give you naloxone and who can treat people with dignity and respect, we've heard that many people don't feel they can utilize their pharmacies in a safe way. So the principles of harm reduction, um, I think are really critical for all of you as practitioners out on the front line. So health and dignity, participant-centered services, uh, participant involvement, participant autonomy, freedom to leave, uh, leave treatment or to leave, leave working with you, freedom to, you know, do, uh, over their body, sociocultural factors and pragmatism and realism. So, um, in many cases, it's it's a matter of any positive change. And when uh, you walk into a syringe service program and people realize that they are treated with dignity and respect and they're not being asked to do any one thing, they can begin to take steps uh, that exert autonomy, that you know they, they of course care about their health uh, and well-being and they can make tiny changes. Uh, in many cases, I see patients who didn't even know there was a doctor on site to do buprenorphine in the syringe service program. And, you know, they hear about it, you know, from the, the group, from the social worker and, 
and then they come to see me, you know, when they're ready. And so, you know, it's a it's a beautiful thing um, to 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 watch that kind of behavior change and to be able to to bring our services to make them as as low barrier as possible instead of asking people to prove themselves, asking people to jump through hoops, asking people to get in line to show their willingness, asking people to stop using drugs for seven days when they're trying to get to a treatment program because they can't stop using drugs for seven days, right? These things don't make any sense. So harm reduction is just like, okay, let's just try to be real about this. And um, I present this slide to all of all of my trainees, and and I present this in, in a way that I, I hope can be useful to you. I I think it's just so useful to think about a continuum of substances, and and I, sometimes I even print it out and I say to my patients, "Where do you think you were in terms of your cocaine use, or where are you in terms of your alcohol use, and and where do?" Uh, I think that, that where do they want to be and where do I want them to be? Of course, no use or abstinence is the safest is the safest thing. Many people don't want to or can't achieve no use. Um, some people find that gap if they're if they're using persistently chaotically, they find that 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 reach to no use as impossible. Um, even moving uh, out of a way that's not chaotic or persistent, you know, moving from a way where they're drinking and they're not blacking out every day, you know, moving from a way where they're drinking five days a week instead of seven days a week. Um, you know, many people uh, actually do kind of age out of substance use and, and, can, and can move to the left with that without abstinence. Of course, abstinence is wonderful if people can achieve it. Um, but many times I think if we don't, if we aren't patient-centered and we don't think about their goals, uh, then, then we can't actually meet people where they're at. We can't actually understand their reality and why they use. One question I ask people all the time is, why do you use alcohol? What do you like about it? What what do you not like about it? What you know, and these are really important for us to understand. Like we've co-evolved with alcohol as a, as a society, as, 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 in, as human beings, we've brewed alcohol in every single society that we, in, in tox, you know, to be intoxicated in every single society that, that we've ever had. Um, why is that, you know, and, and why do people, why do people uh, need to, like, um, want to be intoxicated? Um, why do some people develop problems with it? It's, it's as an anthropologist and, and as a as a clinician, th these are like questions that are so fascinating to me. And everyone's answer is going to be different. Everyone's answer is also going to be different over the course of their life, right? If you look at yourself and your own relationship to, let's say, a illicit substance like alcohol in your 20s or teenage years, you look at it in your 40s or 50s, you're going to have a very different relationship uh, across this continuum. So adapted from Norm Zinberg, we present the risk set setting model. And we really like to think about, this is trying to zoom out again from the substance, the risk, maybe it's drug use or sex work, and think about the conditions in which people are using. Uh, the psychedelic movement has really brought into, into focus what we call the mindset, which is that so, the expectations that someone has to their substance use, to the situation, thoughts, moods, expectations. You can even envision like your your 19 year olds going to a party. Like what's their mindset? You know, how do you keep them safe? Is it you make sure that they had food, that you make sure that their friends are watching out for them? There are ways that you can make their substance use safer and that you might do already. Setting. Um, so again, thinking about the setting. So the physical and social environment of where a person is, their perception of how that can promote or reduce risk. So again, I'll, I'll lead you to think about someone who is injecting in a bathroom. They're worried, they're nervous, they're injecting quickly because they're worried they're gonna get caught. Um, they're alone, they're, they're very high risk of death versus someone who's injecting in a space where it's sterile, where they have access to sterile syringes, where I could give them medication uh, called naloxone or oxygen if they overdose. Um, where you know they could uh, they could access wound care. I could do it on site. So I, again, thinking about setting, uh, do we have places that that offer people safety? I'd argue um, I'd argue we often we really don't. And um, 
while I pose harm reduction as a, as a potential as a potential solution in many states, in many places around the country, we're seeing erosion of harm reduction services. And this will lead me to the next portion of our talk where we talk about stigma. But um, and these are um, some clips from uh, from Atlantic City in New Jersey, um, Austin County, Indiana, where there was a huge HIV and hepatitis C outbreak. And, and basically, uh, again, uh, ways that we can think about why is there a backlash? What is going on? Atlantic City, for example, their, their syringe service program had maybe 50 or 100 people testifying about how it's changed their life. They had uh, people testify with the evidence, doctors, nurses, uh, social workers. And... Um, and still the city council was like, we don't, we don't like it. So, so how, how can we think about um, and, and more effectively communicate with, with politicians, with people that are making decisions about, about what, we, what we believe and know to be true from both studying and, and from a, a human rights standpoint as well. So stigma um, is, is, a big, is a big part of that. So Irving Goffman, um, a sociologist wrote, it's an attribute that's deeply discrediting and, and, and it's the mark of a deviant condition, flawed, spoiled. And later, uh, you know, Bruce, uh, Bruce Link and Joe Fellin uh, have, have built on that and said, this is a process, okay? So this is a process of labeling, stereotyping, cognitive separation, emotional reactions, status loss, and discrimination. We all participate in this process, whether we think we are or not. And as an anthropologist, um, I put in uh, Yang's work, which said that stigma can intensify the sense that life is uncertain, dangerous, and hazardous. So we are all participating in this, whether we, whether we think we are or not. And it's really important to be aware of that and to think about as we go through the world, you know, ways in which we're unconsciously or, or uh, perpetuating or contributing to, to stigma. So in, during COVID, New York City, for example, um, there was some backlash about um, about the way that um, people who were experiencing homelessness, they were um, transitioned to different neighborhoods. So they were transitioned, for example, to the Upper West Side, and this is a photo from the New York Times where they were um, where people were housed um, on the West Side, of uh, which is a, a big area where a lot of um, a lot of restaurants are. And so this is the effect of it, which is basically that um, people, um, uh, be, you know, were uh, displaced and, and resources and services were, had changed and people were confronted with um, uh, poverty and with, and, and with, and with um, mental illness. People were confronted with, um, uh, you know, the, the reality in which people, people live, uh, our, our neighbors live, I'd argue. We had a uh, campaign in San Francisco that got taken down at National Harm Reduction Coalition that really featured actual people who use drugs and some harm reduction materials. Like uh, one says, take it easy, go slow. Another said, uh, no overdose, we're better together, carry naloxone. And um, the idea was to really feature people who are, who are using and, and, and recognize their humanity. Uh, and for many reasons that that campaign was, was taken down. And, and I'd argue that stigma was a big part of that. Again, we, there's complex ways that we've studied stigma and we still don't entirely understand it, but we do know that it, um, uh, I, I, I ran into this stigmatizing um, imagery when I was at, at the needle exchange in the Bronx doing, uh, doing deep and orphan care. And really we do know that it can, uh, it can trigger and exacerbate feelings of worthlessness, hopelessness, dehumanization, and can lead to worsening use. If you've ever taken care of a, um, a pregnant person or someone who, who, who kind of gives up, um, really it can lead to, you know, just people can just say, you know, it can fall into a place where they're like, well, it, it feels completely hopeless. I'm just going to I'm going to just escalate out, out of that sense of hopelessness. And I'm always worried about people that don't show up to me, people that would rather die in an alley of an of a abscess that turns into bacteremia in the blood. Uh, I'm so worried about people who, because of stigma, because of the way they've been treated in the hospital, in the emergency room, would rather die than come see me. So this is, you know, it, this is really life and death for so many people. 
we had a campaign in 10 years ago at, at National Harm Reduction Coalition where we, you know, we told people, you know, to try to engage with doctors to be honest and, and to try to figure out and find someone who was right for them. Um, and and it, it still is, it still is very hard. There is persistent stigma um, and internalized stigma, frankly, uh, from people, from many of my patients uh, with doctors. For example, I would have a patient come up and they'd say things like, you know, I had this rash and I just wanted to get it taken care of. And I don't really want to talk about my heroin, but like no one's going to talk about my rash and, you know, I have a toothache and no one pays it. You know, I would really like to just focus on that. So, so really in a lot of my training, I say to people, you know, let's, let's meet people where they're at. Let's, let's like actually p take care and pay attention to them and, and their, what, what they need at this moment and, and get that done. I read about it in my book where I said, you know, as a medical student, my, my attending physician wanted to get all of this blood work, you know, 10 tubes of blood work on the first visit. And I had just persuaded someone chaotically using heroin to come into the clinic. And, and I said, you know, like, she really has no veins, like, we really can we really just focus on the one reason why she's coming for help, which is she just, you know, her best friend just overdosed, she had to give him naloxone. And, and she's got chaotic heroin use. So, so we, we didn't do any blood work. Um, uh, and, and instead, we tried to focus on the issue that we could most address the most pressing issue. So COVID-19 has made substance use very, very dangerous. We, we were really worried about this in March 2020. And I remember frantically in March 2020, fielding, you know, doing webinars for people who use drugs, drug users unions around the country. We had no idea what COVID-19 was. And, and everyone was asking me how it was transmitted. If you were homeless and you used the blow dryer from the from the washroom, would that spread COVID? If you were doing this kind of sex work, would this spread COVID? Everyone wanted to keep themselves safe. And you know, looking at the overdose deaths that happened from April 2020 to April 2021, I can see that we really failed. Um, and, and and despite sort of our efforts to, to, to keep people alive and to keep people safe and healthy, um, I would say that you know we really failed to to do that on the on the on the on the grand scheme. So we had a lot of a lot of focus uh, groups and and with vital strategies and and Reynolds uh, harm reduction higher ground harm reduction we put out um, tips and ways that, to pe keep people safe and alive. But um, you know I'm looking back at these recommendations that they might still be valid, but um, with with the policies the drug policies that we have uh, we are losing a lot of ground. So this is the the slide that I end with, which which um, is a scheme for for working with patients from the New York State Department of Health, and you know I think it's a practical uh, harm reduction strategy where we build safe plans with patients, and you know we try to equip them with evidence, uh, you know, for 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 being safe and and staying alive and using more safely, and these are practical tips, things like. Using in a space where you can you can be reached if you need help. Avoid leaning on or locking the door. Choosing a place that's clean and well lit. And now we have a never use alone hotline, for example, where people can call. Someone else will stay on the line with them, a volunteer. And you know, I think they've had four thousand calls, and they've only had twenty nine EMS activations. They'll talk to people. They'll provide community for people. They actually offer like practical tips, like don't use against the door where one of them who answers the phone is a paramedic. Um, and so, you know, simple things, practical things, um, but things that treat people with dignity and respect and we hope can save their life. So with that, I will stop and I'm happy to take uh, your questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sue. We'll, uh, Dr. Partridge and I will be going back and forth. So he'll be um, looking at chat questions that have come in and I'll be reading some questions that have been submitted beforehand. But my first uh, question is, um, you showed some things that I think would be really interesting clinical tools. So that continuum of, of drug use chart that you use, and then your last slide. And I was wondering, are those things that you developed yourself and are they in the public domain if clinicians wanted to use those as part of assessment and treatment? Yeah, those are those are um, the first slide. The continuum continuum of substance use slide is is from Harm Reduction Coalition. I think it should be on our website. 
And the, um, the New York State Department of Health has on their website the Build a Safety Plan a tool. And, and I think people can order it as well um, in hard copy. Okay, great, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, one of the questions that came in on the chat was wanting to know if you have any thoughts about veterans courts and their success in engaging veterans in treatment when appropriate in lieu of jail time? Yeah, I mean, I think veterans, veterans courts or drug courts, generally courts that have special training in, in taking care of people who have experienced trauma, who have particular um, backgrounds, I think they can be really useful. I think in many ways it, it, they can be very heterogeneous. So depending on which judge um, people get sometimes, they can, they can have differing approaches and methodologies. I have done many trainings for drug court professionals or different kinds of specialized courts. Many of them don't believe in certain kinds of medications like buprenorphine or methadone, um, despite there being evidence. So I have done a lot of trainings and I've also done trainings for probation and parole as well that basically outline that, you know, not using the medications is, is actually quite fatal. It's not evidence-based um, and, and really, you know, people can have their individual successes, the, the things that might've worked for them, they might have a particular philosophy that might work for them, but what does the evidence say? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so a common concern about harm reduction approaches is that many strategies do not attempt to address underlying psychological contributors to substance use, like trauma, anxiety, and depression. Can you comment on the importance of involving psychologists and clinical social workers in harm reduction programming and the most valuable ways they can contribute in order to maximize the likelihood of success? That is a wonderful question. Um, I think that social workers and, and psychologists are the front line. Um, I think there is a modality of harm reduction called harm reduction therapy, actually. So uh, we have um, in 1990s, in, in response to the HIV crisis in San Francisco, um, Pat Denning and Jeannie Little came up with harm reduction therapy, which was a means of integrating, you know, looking at this flawed treatment system that we all kind of struggle in, looking at the ways that the system is violent to people and said, you know, what, what do you, going back to that continuum slide, what do you, what do you hope for your life? You know, how can we help you actualize well-being? How can, how can we address your adverse childhood experiences? How can we take an intergenerational and community-based trauma-informed approach? And for example, many of the, the patients that came to me in the syringe service program came from the groups run by peers, run by therapists, you know, and, and many patients actually, I see, um, I see therapy as being a, um, a way that once people stabilize on medication, let's say they have chaotic heroin use, and they, I can stabilize them on a medication, and all of a sudden they're like, no longer living on the subway. They're no longer, you know, doing like every six hours trying to hustle to get money in the subway. Their day frees up and they're just like, what do I do now? <laughs> and and, the, and those thoughts and feelings that led to the substance use flood back. Yeah. One of my patients who I took on a podcast and, um, and she took her story, she taught the Columbia medical students with it. She started using heroin after her child was shot and killed in the projects it, you know she had no access to therapy right mm -hmm. so when she was you know younger decades before this happened it was incredibly traumatic and you know she self-medicated with heroin like this very common and terrible story um you know she'd been raped for you know but you know by strangers in a porta potty you know while being home you know i mean these are terrible mm -hmm. stories of you know, people try to cope and they try to live and they come to us and, and so therapy is, is so important. So once people stabilize on medications, they're like, okay, wow, like so much is flooding back. And now my mom wants to talk to me and, and I'm stabilized, but I don't have a good relationship with her because I burn these bridges. And so I think so essential. And, and I don't see them as mutually exclusive from harm reduction and, and definitely check out the Harm Reduction Therapy Center in San Francisco and check out their approach because I think it can be it can be really revolutionary as practitioners to say, like, I'm not going to tell you 
what to do. I'm not going to create friction. I'm not going to push a square peg into a round hole. I'm just going to support, you know, it's, it's actually makes our life easier. I'd say it's an antidote to burnout in many ways to be like, I'm not going to force you to try to stop. Like what, how can I make you safer? How can I walk with you and keep you alive? And you know, it just like, if you mm -hmm. think about not having to push someone to stop so badly, if that's, you know, you know, if that's what they're able to do and the only thing that they, if abstinence is what they need and that, and we see is we see harm reduction as inclusive of abstinence, not as, not as exclusive from it. Awesome. There's a couple of questions here, and I think I'll, I'll throw them together um, relating to international approaches uh, to drug right. policy, um, especially given the disparate uh, level of incarceration and rate of drug-related incarceration uh, that you presented earlier uh, in the United States compared to everybody else. Um, so can you talk about uh, Portugal's approach to substance abuse and what we might uh, learn from that? as well as any thoughts you might have about the new uh, safer supply policy in Canada. Okay, okay, wonderful, wonderful. I think these international questions are super important because uh, while we have some American exceptionalism and certain approaches to drug policy, we really need to look at what other countries have done and innovated. So the, the, the question references 2001, Portugal decriminalized personal possession of drug use, and they said, we're not going to we're not going to incarcerate people for drug use. We're going to talk about it as a public health and a health policy approach. So basically what happens when someone um, is, is, um, is using drugs and an encounter uh, maybe in the street encounters law enforcement or encounters social services, they, uh, they go to uh, see a committee that's actually formed up of legal health care and social work professionals. It's called the dissuasion committee. And basically, people there are given approaches to harm reduction, they're given treatment, they're educated, and in most of these cases are suspended. So really, the rates of incarceration went down after, after this in Portugal. And, and they, accept, they basically took a policy of kind of acceptance of, of substance use as a social fact, and instead of trying to do repressive uh, legislation. You know, in our country, we have legislation that tries to stamp it out, um, and in many ways, it doesn't really it doesn't really address the underlying reasons why people use substances, and in fact, causes further trauma and further um, further impedes people's ability to live well and thrive after incarceration in terms of employment, voting, housing, their children. It, you know, it it does cause a lot of dislocation in Canada. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are um, some really interesting ideas that they're having. Um, the, the, the question references safe supply. And so just to define what that is for people who might not know, basically uh, it is a means of people accessing, for example, diacetyl morphine, or they, they did a study in, um, of, of accessing uh, fent uh, heroin, for example, diacetyl morphine. And, um, and that trial basically showed that people who were able to access heroin, uh, they stopped, you know, overdosing. They stopped dying. They stopped getting as many infections. They started getting their hepatitis C treated. They started working again. Um, and so the safe supply model basically says people are using substances, and people are playing Russian roulette currently with the current drug supply being fentanyl. So basically, I say to my patients, look. I'd love to prescribe you a, safe, a safer medication that you could use, like a hydromorphone, which is Dilaudid, or I'd like to prescribe you, in theory, you know, I could. we can't prescribe heroin in this country, but in theory I could if, if, if we, you know, the Controlled Substances Act didn't exist and, and we could. Um, and you wouldn't have to play Russian roulette. And instead you could come see your doctor every day. You could come see the pharmacist every day. And you could access, this is not just in Canada, but places like Switzerland as well, um, people can access um, access a safe supply. So instead of saying like, okay, well, I'm sorry, you either take the treatment I can offer you, methadone or buprenorphine, and if you don't, if you can't comply with either of those treatments, I relegate, people are currently relegated to Russian roulette. And, and it's led to 100,000 opioid overdose deaths in this country. Thank you so much. 
How effective is treatment for opioid and cocaine addiction and how accessible is treatment, particularly for low income and underinsured clients? Ugh, treatment. So um, these are very interesting questions. So I'll, I'll tackle opioids first um, and then I'll talk about stimulants. So there's a very interesting study that just came out in 2020 by Sarah Wakeman at Mass General. She looked at the real world effectiveness of treatment pathways for opioid use disorder and she compared no treatment, inpatient detox or residential, intensive behavioral treatment like IOP or intensive outpatient services, buprenorphine and methadone, naltrexone, and non-intensive behavioral health. So, you know, just um, accessing, you know, something on a non-intensive manner. That study actually compared six different modalities and it found that in their study of like 40,000 patients, that only treatment with buprenorphine and methadone was associated with reduced risk of overdose and opioid-related acute care at three and 12 months of follow-up. That's not to say that those other modalities aren't important, but what actually saves lives is getting access to this medication that stabilizes their brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, cocaine use disorder is, is actually more difficult. That's, that's a unicorn. So for the last 30 years, people have been trying to access uh, a medication that might help cocaine or stimulant use disorder. And we really don't have anything as effective as methadone or buprenorphine, which is you know, really effective once people can get on it, they, 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 stop, they stop overdosing and it increases our mortality. Now cocaine, um, the, the therapies that we have for the 2.2 million cocaine users in this country um, really is, exists, uh, you know, certainly like the treatment is thin. It's mostly cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, there are some, uh, but people really are, are not engaged that much in that. We have contingency management programs, which are evidence-based and we're trying to get um, therapy for that. That's basically saying, okay, uh, you engage with our clinic, you come back, you have a negative urine based on you know cognitive kind of psych psychology and, and behavioral reinforcement. Um, if you have a, 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 you can be entered in to win a prize. And so you can get money or cash for, for, for negative toxicology, achieving your health goal. And that may be not having methamphetamine in your, in your urine. And so those actually uh, are, have, have good evidence behind them for stimulant use disorder, meth and cocaine. And we're trying to figure out ways to scale those up. Obviously it's a difficult, it's a difficult ask. And they're not available. These are very, you know, and, and even medication for opioid use disorder is not available. Like I mentioned, one percent of jails and prisons have access to them. Um, of the number of doctors in the country that could prescribe buprenorphine, you know, very very small percent actually do. You go up to your, you try to find help for your mother, you know, your son or daughter who has a heroin problem. You go onto the, the SAMHSA website, you look it up. Half those numbers are dead. Um, uh, and then, you know, they, we do secret shopper studies, half those numbers are dead. And then, you know, some of the, many of those people don't even practice anymore and you can't even get in, you know, like, so basically, um, they're not available, especially for people who, who lack access to a phone who lack access to resources, who don't have necessarily health literacy, who lack access to insurance, who, who are experiencing structural racism. So it's abysmal we really have to to lower you know we, we imagine our way to, to increase access to treatment right i want to follow up on that actually what what are the barriers what's your understanding of of those barriers and and why it's so unavailable i think it's really important for us to go back to the stigma question yeah and you know really there is deep 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 stigma so i just was on a panel about methadone treatments and not in my backyard or NIMBYism. Yeah. You know, many, many people, you know, don't want programs in, you know, treatment programs in their neighborhood. Many people don't want shelters, you know, in their in their neighborhood. Um, and many people see medication like medication has been the the way we think about medication has been, in many ways, dissuaded by a deep philosophy towards abstinence that, in some ways, comes from AA. Although Bill W. actually had alcohol at their meetings in the, in the early meetings because they knew people were going to go into withdrawal. They knew people were going to go into the shakes as they stopped. Like, and so he never said anything about, about no medication, you know, and, and, and so 
the way I compare it is like, okay, if you had a heart attack and you dropped dead or you had, you almost dropped dead in front of me and you, I see you in the hospital or you had an overdose, you almost dropped dead. Mm -hmm. And the, the risk of that happening again is incredibly high. Now, if I saw you after a heart attack, I would start you on five new medications, no questions asked for the rest of your life. No one's gonna weigh in on the dose of it. No one's gonna weigh in on anything. I could, you know, I could pay, you could get those medications paid for if you become incarcerated at Rikers. Even if you get a stent that costs $50,000 to keep the medication open for your stent, you're gonna get that at Rikers Island. Mm -hmm. um, now, if I start to med methadone, which can save your life after an overdose, in many places, you're gonna be cut off. You're gonna go into withdrawal if you become incarcerated. Methadone costs pennies. Mm -hmm. And other people weigh in and say, you should get off that stuff. You know, when really that, like, if you're on that for the rest of your life and you're 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 able to you know, work and have your job and raise your family or other things, no one weighs in on, on everyone weighs in on methadone. So I, all my pregnant patients, they get told to taper down, they taper off immediately and then they overdose and die in the first year. It's number eight cause of maternal mortality in this country is opioid overdose death. You're a new mother and they're trying to taper off methadone when really what you do is stabilize because you're in the most chaotic year of your life with a newborn and you've you know, you had a lot of, you know, so so this anti-medication, you know, this this is a deep, deep stigma and, and patients feel it and they hear it and they want, and it's very hard for me to talk them out of it yeah. because this discourse is so strong that it's a crutch, et cetera. And I'm gonna say, well, is your atorvastatin to prevent having a another heart attack? Is that a crutch? Right. Is your, you know, and, and I and I'd say it's keeping, you know, and no one, no one, no one weighs in on that dose and tells you to keep trying to lower your atorvastatin dose. If you had a heart attack, you need eighty milligrams, and I'm not going to argue with you about, you know. So, so it's very interesting. So that is, I think, stigma is is, you know, is a big thing. So we had campaigns in New York City where it says methadone saved my life, buprenorphine uh -huh. saved my life, mm -hmm. and people's mm -hmm. names and stories of of their success because it's so, it's so stigmatized. Thank you so much. That's excellent. Um, I think uh, one of the questions here that kind of is a good follow up to that has to do with um, moving substance use out of a criminal justice system and into public health, mm -hmm. how that would affect our drug policies and stigma uh, and things like, uh, and another question asked about, you know, supervised consumption centers, mm -hmm. um, and, and it all seems to get wrapped up in, you know, whether we view this through a public health lens or through a criminal justice lens. And I would also add, I'm curious about what you think about the sort of uh, structural racism that underlies that in that certain drugs get viewed more as a public health issue and other drugs get seen more as a criminal issue, uh, comparing like, you know, the recent opiate crisis versus the crack cocaine crisis mm -hmm. uh, in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot there, but they're all kind of wrapped up in that shifting lens. Yes, yes. The shifting lens is so critical. So I've been thinking about Oregon. Oregon decriminalized drug possession in, in, through a ballot measure last year, uh, the measure um, 110. And uh, basically, um, I'd say that they, they actually just refunded Oregon uh, for a, another $270 million into substance use treatment services, or harm reduction services as well. And basically what they estimate too, is they estimate that thousands of people in that state would avoid having the consequences of the lifelong consequences of a drug arrest, loss of employment, educational opportunities, housing, public benefits, custody for children, immigration. And they estimated that that, that would result in a 95% reduction in racial disparities in drug arrests. So, Oregon is doing something that is an experiment that we are keeping our eye on. I mean, I think that we, that it is being closely studied and, and watched as, as a way, as one of the, our, you know, our states in our context, in the American context, that is trying to do something differently. So I think, I think you know, I'm very optimistic and, and I do think that shift, you know, these the programs need to be done well, you know, they have to, they have to really be done in a way that that is conducive, that has out, that has good outcomes. Um, I think, I think that, um, you know, thinking about all of the different substances, I think it's like, like you said, I think that uh, comparing opioids, comparing crack cocaine or thinking about cocaine and stimulants, we have to really reckon with the history, the sort of the racist history of, of, um, 
of our drug laws, uh, the, the cocaine, uh, cocaine powder disparity. Uh, the, those disparities actually still exist. Instead of 100 to 1, they're 18 to 1. They still exist. Um, and we know, you know, I take care of many, uh, many white people that smoke, that smoke crack, uh, that, that, that don't go to prison and jail, um, that, that get treatment. And that is a, that is a reality. And, and I think uh, as long, you know, there are, there are ways that, and even as a doctor promoting a public health approach, I, and I'm talking to, to uh, black Americans or talking to people who've, who've, who've been incarcerated, they're, they're pissed. <laughs> You know, they're really mad that, that they were having a public health approach and they had a they had a they had a prison approach and they think it has to do with sort of the, the white the shifting whiteness the deaths of despair and and I think we need sort of truth and reconciliation around these issues the legacies of of, of our approaches to cocaine and and thinking about ways that we can we can we can ameliorate ways that we can do reparations to, to, to people who've been harmed by the drug war it's super important and um, and so, you know, I think that the public health lens offers us uh, offers us a lot of solutions. Now, one person said, "Well, if you close Rikers Island, so there was a debate in New York City, close Rikers Island." They're like, "If you close Rikers Island, you close access to 500 people who get started on methadone and buprenorphine every uh, every every month." Let's just say, you know, I just made that up. But like, how can we envision a world where we don't? need that as part of our healthcare system currently is serving a stopgap for the most it's 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 starting people on this life-saving medication but how can we envision envision a world where the prison and jail doesn't doesn't have to doesn't have to do that you know where community clinics actually are built up so that they can start people on the same day and people can walk in instead of people being incarcerated or or you know i've seen so many people that access therapy for the first time in in rikers island it's 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 terrible you know so the first time they had someone to talk to for an hour you know for free was in rikers island you know it's just like it's just terrible it's not what you would want it's not the world we want to build right mm -hmm. thank you speaking of um prisons and jails and the criminal justice system what's being done to educate criminal justice personnel on um, issues around mental health disorders and their relationship to substance use disorders and the development of a justice department that um, is competent in managing um, substance use disorders and mental health disorders. Right, right. This is, this is important. Um, I helped uh, develop some, New York State just passed legislation to, um, to offer medication for opioid use disorder in all prisons and jails. So, I've, um, I was part of um, helping uh, one of the local jails set up a buprenorphine program. So we started a buprenorphine program and they, they, we phased it into three ways. First, for the patients that came in on the medication, basically we said, okay, maybe there's only five people who are on the medication, but we'll start as a test run. We'll start with the patients who are already on it. We expanded it to people that were, um, that were about to be released. And then we expanded it to people with any opioid use disorder across any period. And, um, and now, you know, over 100 people are in, in that county jail or on medication and the system is very, is very functional. They, they've set someone up upon release. Um, but through that training, people, um, people got fired. I mean, people, if they said, if you don't, if you don't um, understand the evidence-based approach we're taking, we're gonna train all of the officers we're going to talk to the doctor. Many nurses were like, you know, this is not how we do it. We have a treatment unit, which is therapeutic, and we just talk. And many, many didn't believe in medication. Again, I don't, you know, I don't know how you can't believe in medication, so to speak. But um, the, the sheriff was like, this is what we're going to do. So I do think it takes a lot of leadership. He really wanted to get out there. He really wanted to be seen as someone, you know, taking taking leadership, you know, taking the leadership. And he he actually um, started a program and, and other counties actually would, would transfer to, you know, shift patients who, who need that, that medication to him. And he also started methadone. He worked with three methadone program, OTPs, opioid treatment programs in his area and started methadone, um, which is really the gold standard. I mean, it, it, we have the highest retention rates on methadone. So um, it was wonderful. And so, I, you know, I think now, I had gone through and trained everyone in the prison system. So all the doctors were trained and they were, 
And so they're either going to have to do it or not do it. So, so they, you know, so I mean, we have to do many things we want to do in our jobs, and we may or may not believe we or like it. Um, but, but you know, this is this is one of the shifting things. And and so I think, you know, I think understanding that it's the the being presented with the data and being presented, you know, with the uh, the life saving effects of it and. And then, and then, you know, hopefully people come around. And actually the prisons and jails say, you know, people are not in opioid withdrawal. They're not having cravings. They're not acting up. They're not being bad. Like they're not, you know, they're not using drugs. They're, they're actually getting the medication that they need. So in many ways, from a security standpoint, it's actually, it's actually probably better overall. So, so for people that have security concerns, uh, we did, we did say to them, you know, I mean, you know, it's, in treating people with what they need actually makes people feel better and, 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 and act out less. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, there's a question about uh, whether you know of any evidence or anecdotal accounts um, about cannabis use as a viable harm reduction tool, uh, particularly for those with chaotic heroin, fentanyl use, um, and uh, limited access to methadone. So um, cannabis use is, um, is, is interesting. It's being studied for actually some people. And uh, there is a small study out of, uh, out of people who use crack cocaine in Vancouver that the cannabis was interesting as an adjunct. So cannabis use is not a treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, uh, we in New York State, if, if we do medical cannabis, and now it's legal, but in New York State where it was medical, you could not prescribe it. You had to be wavered to treat opioid use disorder uh, basically to prescribe buprenorphine, you could not do it in lieu of medication for opioid use disorder. You could do it as an adjunct on top. So we would often um, see patients, you know, who, who would, um, who would be, who would like to use cannabis for anxiety or sleep pain or whatever they, they whatever, you know, that was useful to them. But we, you could not, um, we could not use it um, as treatment for, for opioid use disorder. We could use it on top, and many people have 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 developed, um, and also for pain. So many people do get some some relief from from that standpoint. But again, it's not it's no stand it's no substitute for for what we know, um, which is methadone since the 1960s and 70s, and buprenorphine buprenorphine since 2000. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think things are really changing and we should look to the states for studies of, of, of how of, of cannabis as well, because there's many ways that cannabis is emerging, um, and, you know, as, as, as it increases in availability. And, and you know, from a harm reduction standpoint, um, if people are using certain substances, I mean, um, you know, we, we, have, we have no documented cannabis deaths from overdose you know i mean and we have a hundred thousand opioid overdose deaths so if a patient says to me that they're using fentanyl or they're to go to sleep or they're going to use cannabis like it's kind of a no-brainer you know mm -hmm. i'm going to you know if, if that's what they're if that's what helps them then then i would much rather them not die absolutely um speaking of, of medication therapies if you could wave a magic wand and look 15 to 20 years down the road, based upon the uptake of agonist and partial agonist therapies, well, do you expect that there'll be any unintended consequences that this country will have to address? That's an interesting question. Um, I wish we had more access to agonist therapies because mm -hmm. as I presented in the data, we actually have very little so one in five patients after experiencing a non-fatal overdose gets access, gets offered life-saving, these life-saving medications. So that's over a treatment gap of over a million people. Um, I do think this question reflects back to thinking about how we're in this conundrum we are in with, the, with prescription opioids. So with the oxycodone, for example, and the way that sort of looking back on the 90s, the way physicians were oversold, were overmarketed, um, you know, were, were targeted, were um, you know manipulated. Pharmacists, you know, big, 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 you know, everyone was complicit in this. And you know, it's um, 
it's an interesting situation. I, you know, I wish the treatment was was more widely accessible so that people could live long and full lives. I think the, uh, the consequences would be that more people would not have de- died. Of not the hundred thousand people that we had would not have died, yeah. um, and that they could have lived full and long and, and productive lives. Um, and so I think that that's the most important thing to say. I think um, whether they're on medication or not, I hope that they live. You know, I hope that they're able to live and achieve what they want in their life. Mm-hmm. Partial agonists are incredibly safe. So buprenorphine has a ceiling effect on respiratory depression, meaning even if you took like eight or 10 of them at once, your brain just won't OD in that. You just, you, you, in many, you know, many cases, it's just impossible to, it's not impossible to, but it, it's, it's so rarely involved in overdose. And so that makes it a wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, that's different from methadone, which is a full agonist, where the more, the more you increase the dose, the increased uh, chance of death. But all of these are leagues safer than what people are currently using, fentanyl. Mm-hmm. And um, and if people could walk out and access buprenorphine, like they can walk out and access, you know, uh, a dealer. You know, if, mm-hmm. if it was easy as easy for them to get onto treatment as it is for them to get, you know, to get to get a substance, then then you know, like we need to take our cues from people who have figured this out. I mean, it's it's a shame. I mean, it's a real shame that you have to wait for two weeks or that you have to die on a waiting list or that, you know, you can't access a program or what, what you might need. So I think that 15 or 20 years from now, I, I will look back and say that, you know, too many uh, of my friends um, and, and people that, that I've worked with and, and known and, and loved have died because they've lacked access to that stigma, you know, the stigma they lacked access to that medication. Um, and so I hope that um, COVID and telehealth and other things, we can innovate our, a little bit out of this. Thank you. Um, I have a question here about uh, how do you, if at all, engage sex workers in your harm reduction work? That is great. Um, I. Um, I take a lot of cues from um, people who, who, who engage in sex work. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, we had a, uh, a one. I did a. Uh, I've done a couple webinars for um, them on on COVID, on preventing COVID. What we thought was uh, the most practical way to prevent COVID transmission for people who are doing sex work, um, and and really just thinking practically about about ways to support them, ways to ways ways to keep them safe. Um, they've been uh, uh, they've been doing this for for a long time. Uh, ways that they can uh, support themselves in their organizing um, and, and ways that they can access supplies uh, to keep themselves safe. Um, there's many organizations, many syringe service programs have bad date, um, have bad date lists that get circulated for people that are violent, um, you know, ways to think about for um, people who are doing sex work to get, um, to get what they need to protect themselves against HIV or hepatitis C if they want to start PrEP medication that would be wonderful to prevent HIV infection. Um, and just thinking about supporting them, meeting their needs um, and, and doing what we can to, to stop also sort of repressive legislation against them and, and, and you know, helping them uh, organize really is, is what, what I see. In many of our conferences, we have, uh, we have ways to think about it about um, it, ways that we can interface and engage with people who are engaging in sex work and using drugs. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. So one person was wondering, how did you get involved in this research and work? <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I, I kind of uh, I got schooled in, in, uh, by a bunch of uh, harm reductionists uh, and, and HIV activists in the in the 90s or uh, um in the early 2000s who um who basically said you know this is our emergency uh these are these are what we you know these are these are social issues that are affecting our you know our ability to live and our bodies and anthropology was an amazing lens to look at that it was a it was a critical lens it was a way to look at systems it was a way to look at outside of just individuals and to look at how our systems harmed. 
and I became very uh, involved with uh, HIV activism and and um, and that led to my work in the prison and in, in jails, which I see as our predominant, one of our foremost shames in this country and one of the biggest sort of human rights issues in this country. And and that really led me to thinking about um, substance use and and why why do people go to prison and jail for substance use and how can we have a world without that? And and like I said, as a doctor, as an anthropologist, like I just love talking about drugs. Like I love talking to people about every person's different, like why people use whatever psychoactive substance they're using. And I could talk to I could talk to people forever about it across their life course, really quite young people, quite old people, like getting pretty altered, you know, and like, why are people do that? Like as a, as an anthropologist, as sociologist, as psychologist, like this is all fascinating to us, right? Um, you know, what, what about people's lives and what about their histories? And, and so that, that really led me to where I am. And, and that's how I kind of, uh, how I think about things. Um, related a little bit, um, are there any policy efforts underway that move the U.S. towards a more harm reduction approach? And um, how can folks get involved to advocate and uh, push for these kinds of policies? Yes, yes. So um, you might have seen that there's, there's there's been a shift in the federal government. If you're in the Biden administration, we are, are now talking about harm reduction. Harm reduction was 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 finally for the first time in 20 or 30 years mentioned, it was no longer wiped out of, of government reports. Harm reduction is seen as a pillar of, an, of a modern and contemporary approach to substance use. The Biden administration, the ONDCP has rolled out harm reduction as one of the strategies. You know, preventions there, treatments there, harm reduction is a, is a critical pillar. It is being funded. Um, we, are, we are trying, for example, it's very complicated. For example, when, when the ONDCP announced $30 million for harm reduction, we said, great. And they said, you could use them for syringes, which people need. Yes, wonderful. We need, we need that pipeline. You can use them for fentanyl test strips. But in many states, fentanyl test strips are considered paraphernalia. So for someone to use it to check their subsupply to see if it's sort of Connecticut, where, where I now live, they're they're crim they're criminalized. So if someone is caught with it, they you know, and they are basically using it to try to determine if their substance has fentanyl, um, they could go to like my car is full of fentanyl test strips. Like I I have I have I have meth pipes and, and fentanyl test strips all over my car. So basically, like you know, I would you know I would I would not go to prison and jail, but that's because of structural privilege and all these other things. But basically like that, so people are working at, at your state level. Um, I'm actually talking to the Michigan Medical Society in December. So I think thinking about at your state level, there's so much innovation going on. So the ballot, the ballot, um, the ballot measure that happened in Oregon, that was a referendum. You know, these are like signatures. People door knocked for that ballot. That is like, at, that is popular, dem that is democracy, right? So I think there's ways to innovate locally I think there's ways to support your local syringe service program. So seeing, you know, in Michigan, who, who are the, who are the people who are out there on the ground? Are they being paid? Are they being supported? Do they have grants? Are they? What do they need? You know, like um, how can they? Do they need research on on their programs? A lot of them, like, you know, want to study their programs. They want to evaluate them. They don't know how. You know, what could they benefit from therapy? So San Francisco funded local. Um, therapists to go on the street with their mobile their mobile homelessness team. So they have street therapists. Like people are doing all kinds of cool innovations on the ground. So I think thinking, you know, like, okay, like what do people need? Like is it naloxone? Like are people, you know, do people are people using alone in Michigan? Are people using, you know, do people need access to the never use alone hotline? Like what do, you know, what are kind of local needs assessments? There is innovation at the federal level. I mean, I think that money will trickle down and it needs to be spent on harm reduction and low barrier treatment programs. Sometimes I look at my own house and I say, my clinic is not, you know, is not that friendly in terms of X or my, my clinic, you know, are they still kicking out people from methadone clinic that are using cocaine? Like, are we, 
are, you know, we, there's still some basic things, right? Like, are we jeopardizing people's treatment? Um, you know, do they, do, you know, are there ways that people who are involved in child protective services, are there ways that we can be harm reduction oriented? You know, child protective services is the carceral aspect for so many women and families and poor black, uh, you know, and brown families that are policed and surveilled. Like, are there, I've been involved in many cases where, you know, people, you know, we have this whole thing where we have white, you know, wealthy moms who pillow for Peloton for wine, you know, and with listed substances and cannabis, you know, someone can call you, call, if you live in public housing, someone can call on cannabis and say, I smoke, smell cannabis and, and, and something, a, a charge is, uh, an investigation is opened. Um, and, and, you know, if, if you get on the state registry in New York, that you can't you don't get off that registry for until your oldest child is 28 and you can't get a job so, you know so so there's all these collateral consequences like and and you may or may so I, I i was signing on to be the medical director of a methadone clinic and i had to go through the state central registry forms as well and i was like wow this is this is what the registry means i mean and it, it basically means if you'd ever been charged with a you know a a child protective services or some kind of case or it'd been open even if it had been opened and so these are there's all kinds of layers and so i think if you look at your tiny corner of the world and you can approach it um practically what, what do people need and what can you do in your clinic or in your practice thank you that's really helpful yeah so speaking of women i actually i'm going to pull a question from the chat because it connects with excuse me, another question that I have. Um, what are the drivers of the disproportionate increase in incarceration rates for women? And then a follow-up to that for me is, what do we know about the children and families of those women? Yes, yes, this is an area where a lot of research needs to be studied. Um, I think, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, this is an area where a lot needs to be studied. We the, the drivers of, of, of incarceration of women are really interesting. So for example, a lot of women went to prison and jail because they were sold out by, they were low on the, the they were low in the drug supply chain. People, they had no, one of my, my, my key informants in my book was low, you know, like low level using because she was a part of the and she went to prison for four, two to five years. and. He, she had no information to negotiate with, and she basically went to prison. We have many cases of, of, of there are many cases of incidents of violence, domestic violence, where women are protecting themselves again against people who are using drugs. Um, and so many of these, many, and, and, and honestly, just also survival and, and, and inability, for example, with COVID and other things, there were there are very high rates of homelessness among women who use drugs, and and they have, they can't comply with probation and parole because they're they're not at their residence or etc. They don't have one or etc. They don't have a phone. So there's so this has tons of consequences. It has consequences on their families. You know their families. Um, you know it causes so much trauma. Right? Sesame Street came out with the first the first Muppet or puppet or you know that that had a parent who was incarcerated because so many black Americans disproportionately have, ex their children have experienced incarceration and that's traumatic. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, there are sort of mother, child, you know, parent, child programs, but at that point, many of these, many of the harms have been done of, of parents, you know, having having been been separated um, by the state. So, so I do think we, we really need, and I do think thinking and studying child protective services the, the structural racism in that, that, that is kind of where I would love to see people going because it, it, it is incredibly punitive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. So Ty, did you see anything else in the chat? Um, yeah, I'm glad that you got to the question about the, the increase in uh, rates mm -hmm. um, for women and what's kind of driving that. Um, someone did ask about um, a resolution for getting the largest outdoor heroin uh, users off the streets of Kensington Avenue in Philadelphia, and what you thought about that? I'd say the resolution. I did some field work in Kensington, so whoever whoever posed that question, nice. 
Um, I did some field work in Kensington, which is an open air drug market um, in 2012 or 13. And my answer is overdose prevention centers. So I, I skipped that question that, that Ty had before, which are places, safe consumption spaces or overdose prevention centers where people can use. People don't want to use in the street. They don't want to. They don't want to. Um, they would love to use, so many people would love to use a place that is clean, well lit, that has food for them, that takes care of them, that doesn't rush them out. Many people would love to use. I actually spoke on a panel two years ago for Fordham Law School where the, the, the law student that organized it died of an overdose. I spoke to his parents. I looked at his parents two to four feet away from me and I said, wouldn't you rather your son have used instead of used secretly in a bathroom in your house to have used with me i could take care of him overdoses are preventable i can get him the medication that literally saves his life people are, are dead and blue i can save his life we have this miracle medication and oxygen wouldn't you want those places for your children for other people's children for a community and and it was heartbreaking you know he was a law student who had an opioid use disorder he didn't make it to his panel on supervised consumption spaces. So that is kind of where we need to go. Rhode Island has authorized them. We are trying in many, many cities around the country, New York, San Francisco, LA, um, Boston, Massachusetts, Denver. Um, so there's uh, Seattle, Portland, there are many efforts, um, but people are using outside inside bathrooms people are going to use it's kind of a social fact and i would rather people use in a place they're welcome they're treated with dignity and respect and and can access health care and social services awesome thank you wonderful thank you so much dr sue for joining us today and i want to thank everyone for attending today the launch of the james and janice prochaska annual lecture series we invite you to join us tomorrow at 11.30, also on Zoom, for a smaller and more intimate discussion with Dr. Zoom, with Dr. Sue as a follow-up to today's lecture. If you need the Zoom link, please visit events.wing.edu and RSVP via the event listing. The Zoom link will then be emailed to you. For those seeking CE credits, please be sure to click on the attendance link in the chat. Thank you again, Dr. Sue. Thank Take you care, so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.